Well, yes, absolutely, as far as we can tell, and we should be thrilled by that fact. First of all, there's really no evidence of design and purpose to the universe that we can see in any case. And in my last book, I showed how the entire universe can be created spontaneously from nothing without any supernatural shenanigans. And so even our whole universe could be here by chance. But once you're in our universe, what, what this book is about is the remarkable fact that even the laws of physics we see today are somewhat accidental. So the universe wasn't even designed for life. The fundamental laws of physics don't necessarily allow life at all. And we're here by an accident, just like an icicle on a window. Uh, and we should celebrate that fact, that because it, 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 in some sense, it, what cosmic arrogance lies at the notion that somehow if, if the universe isn't designed for us, it's not interesting. It's absolutely interesting. And uh, everything we see makes it more exciting. And the fact that we're here as a cosmic accident means in some sense that life is more precious and we should enjoy our brief moment in the sun. Well, of course, it depends on the notion of spirituality, but I, I think there's a tremendous amount of spirituality. When I look at a Hubble Space Telescope picture, I get awe and wonder. What, what, what more of a spiritual experience can I have than that? But the spirituality of science is much better than the spirituality of religion because it's real. And when we look out at the universe, especially in these potentially dark times, as we worry about our myopic problems from Brexit to Donald Trump. The great thing about cosmology and thinking about grand issues is it can take us away from that and realize that th this too shall pass, that the universe itself is so interesting that uh, pondering it can make our current dismal experience seem perhaps uh, a little less important. Well, every time I write a, a book, I'm surprised, uh, and in particular, learning history is always surprising because you learn physics in, in kind of a logical order and, uh, and, and what's worked. It's, it's sort of the vic it's always the story of history that the victors write the history, and it's true for science as well, that the successful ideas are the ones you learn about, but when you actually try and understand the, the, the real history of how things worked, it's much more complicated. The red herrings that people go through, the fact that so many times people came so close to the right answer but didn't realize they were there. That focusing on one force was actually the way to explain another force. That kind of, that, with hindsight, it's really easy to understand that. But, but to understand that human story is really so exciting because new ideas come forth and, and I think people learn that science is a communal enterprise. It's not just done by one or two people. It, 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 and often things are, are done by baby steps. And, and you can learn a lot from from the wrong way of understanding things to, to, to realize how we finally got here. And uh, I think the other thing that I, that I really uh, was new for me, whenever I try and explain something, of course, uh, I have to understand it in a new way when I'm trying to explain it in, in, in a popular language. And that's often a great challenge, but also a learning experience. And one of the central ideas I wanted to talk about was, was the fact that the, the second half of the 20th century was really one of the most revolutionary periods in science that we, we know of and in physics, even though we think of the first half with quantum mechanics and relativity as being important. The second half changed our perspective of where we are and the ideas of symmetries of nature are so important. And that's a really esoteric notion and, and particularly one type of symmetry called a gauge symmetry. is really hard to explain but it's central to our current understanding of all physical theories. And in thinking about a new way to describe it, which I'm very proud of and is in the book, I realized that that new analogy allowed me to think of gauge symmetry in new ways. So I could have predicted results that I couldn't have thought of otherwise mathematically with this picture. So I'm very happy that I, in some sense, I learned something from that as well. Part of this book reinforced my notion that this is the greatest story ever told so far, that the story of science is truly amazing and unexpected, and these revolutionaries, so I guess the things I want people to realize is that the last 40 years have been truly revolutionary. They're li we are living in incredibly exciting times. We tend to think of so the times of Galileo when he first saw the moons of Jupiter as an amazing time. We are living in equivalent times to that. I think that the, the fact that, again, to overcome the common misconception that, that science is done by a few great minds 
it's really a communal enterprise. It's a wonderful enterprise that brings humanity together. That science is, the Large Hadron Collider was built by 10,000 physicists from 100 countries speaking many languages, all working together. Science is, is about humanity at its best. Again, in these troubled times when we're seeing humanity at its worst, it's wonderful to realize how science, like art and literature, can lift us up and make the best of what, what it means to be human. The other thing is that the world of our experience is in many ways an illusion. That what we see is a surface layer, but if you go down below that, the fundamental uh, nature of reality is very, very different. And uh, that, as I say, is an accident. But the fact of how science can allow us to overcome our biases and overcome illusion and cut through to the heart of things is really part of the story I want to tell. And again, I think that has application far more broadly than just science in a world of fake news and, and false advertising. Learning to be skeptical and to, and to force your beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around is what's so important. Being willing to be wrong, all of these things are a central part of this story that I think have, have application that, that, that's far greater than that uh, of just the history itself, even though the history is truly amazing. In some ways, yes. I think, I think British audiences are used to serious discussions, perhaps a little more than American audiences, serious discussions of science, in fact. So I'm always impressed when I come to the UK talking to science journalists and the public that people are willing to think seriously about science. But in another way, it's, it's not that different. I think most people are excited by science, it's just they don't know what science that they're excited by. And most people really have the same questions. How, how do we get here? Are we alone? Why are we here? Those questions. And by the way, I should say that the why questions are really how questions in science. When we, we talk about why, it implies purpose, but what we really mean is how. And, but those questions are really central to all aspects of being human. Everyone's asked them at some time in their life. And in that sense, I hope when I can motivate audiences to think about things, that the, that the reaction is largely the same, that people are really excited by reality. We've just done so much to, to destroy that excitement in our schools and our media that, that we just have to remind people that everyone is born to be a scientist. Well, that's the reason this, the book is called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. I don't know what the questions of the future are. We don't know. If I did, of course, I'd be working on them right now. The story of the universe will become ever more exciting, and the best part of the greatest story ever told is that the best part is still to come.